go much deeper into the subject, not just about what happened. You have to understand the circumstances of how it happened, where it happened. So you, as a narrative journalist, you're putting the story in context, essentially. And that context becomes part of the story. That's what it make, it brings a narrative arc. Like, what are some details you may have picked up on that you would never have included in a news story, for example, but because you were doing long form, you decided to include them to add some flavor? Or just give an example of a story you may have done. Okay, I wrote a story about four years ago about a former attorney general. And while I was interviewing him, uh, I'm sitting in his office and he mentions, you see, there are all these cheap pens on my table. And they're all gifts. I don't buy expensive pens. I later spoke to his son who told me uh, his father has a very good collection of expensive pens. Mm -hmm. So when the attorney general said, these are all gifts, and he said, these are cheap pens, nobody gifts cheap pens to the attorney general. So these are small details that you can pick up and you can write in a long form or a narrative piece. This won't make it to a newspaper uh, piece, essentially. Nima, did you have anything uh, to add to that? Or uh, I think that uh, when it comes to narrative uh, non-fiction pieces, just like a piece of fiction here also because people are more and more interested in the voices of the people you're representing in the piece so which means that you need to have characters in your piece just like you would have in a piece of fiction or uh, you would pick up scenes here and there for instance like recently i did a piece on mayavati and so it was about what did she do after 2014 and there you have to construct this scene, you know, so there are scenes that you need to create, you need to put in characters so that, and then pick up two, three threads and follow them through the piece, which is, so that the reader is more interested. So you write it in the same way as a piece of fiction would be written, but except that these people exist. So which is, which is again a thing because you have to be uh, sensitive about the fact that whatever you're writing does not uh, put like creates a siege for the people you're writing for does not put them into trouble and that's why they have to be more tender and more sensitive at the same time and at times because it's a non-fiction piece and it's a narrative piece where you're constructing these pieces by talking to like 10 different people who were there at that moment that you're constructing in the piece in spite of that you do get into trouble because people come back and sue you and then after that you kind of acquire a very interesting afterlife which both me and Krishna have acquired in some way. So yes, but I would say that you do use the same tropes in a narrative. True, sorry, uh, I mean what Nina said, there are of course scenes that take the story forward. Nina's Mayavati story has this excellent anecdote uh, about Mayavati being humiliated because she was stuck in a room full of men and she was menstruating so she didn't have access, so she felt really humiliated during those days. That tells you how or what motivated Mayavati to do what she did later. So these certain scenes, they become part of a narrative uh, non-fiction story, which again, you will not find them in newspaper reporting. It can stand out as an anecdote just by itself, but what, what importance does it hold for Maya, in Mayavati's career? That's what narrative non-fiction can bring to you. And also I would just like to add because there is so much content coming in online and there is so much to read. So to get people to read things, the same story which is like in the traditional scheme of things, five W's and one H, not saying who told, was told by as told to, but getting more and more in readers interested in an age where people mostly read news through like uh, Twitter feeds. I think narrative pieces also helping get more readers to read the same thing in a more interesting format. So the next thing I want to ask you about is just who is reading long form and you know uh, what kind of reactions have you had to your pieces and what do they tell you about who your audience is? Uh, <laughs> start? Or go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, I would say that people uh, because I do both long form and other kinds of like smaller pieces simultaneously. So I would say that there are people who are, if, because in long form, like I said, that you kind of look back at the issue and people are generally interested in knowing that, okay, what was happening behind the closed doors at, in the PMO or in Amit Shah's office? And you construct those scenes. And which is why people are interested in those smaller, intricate details 
and which is why uh, I do feel that more and more people are uh, reading in long form, whether it's coming online, whether it's coming in a hard copy, whether it's say a piece of reportage which is which has been converted into books. Uh, I would say that, and for instance, like we were discussing, that uh, Politico has again launched another new uh, long form magazine where they're again doing these things. Similarly, I came across yesterday, I was reading that there's a slow journalism project which has come up with a magazine called Delayed Gratification, which kind of sounds very cheesy to me. But what they do is like every uh, three months, they compile uh, news from the last three months and they compile it in this magazine and give it to people so that people who are fed up with this constant, uh, like constant, uh, you know, uh, attack of content or news or articles towards them, they can just look up one thing and they'll get the entire, uh, you know, get the idea about whatever is happening. So, yes. Krishna, have you had any reactions or who, who do you think is reading you, basically? <laughs> Let's not say me, but long form, I think everybody reads long form. Not everybody is interested in the day's headlines, to be honest. If that was true, the newspaper would not be doing this badly. But everybody is likes to look, hear a good story, whether it's about a politician, whether it's about their star. It's it could be anyone. Even the magazines that report solely on Bollywood, they have, they also have long form. What happened at that party? That's also long form. They're reconstructing something. So everybody is reading long form journalism, I believe. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference then, if you know, even newspapers have long form within the, within their within their pages? Uh, what, what's kind of the difference as you see it between working for something like Caravan where you kind of spent several years and now your, your job now at Indian Express? Um. Well, the main difference is of course the time you get to do a story. In Caravan I was given anything between four months to six months to work on the story and like that's, that includes four months of reporting and maybe a month of writing and editing of course. Uh, in newspapers you don't have that luxury because you're always reporting on something as a beat. So even when you go uh, when you are asked to do a long piece, you have very few days, a limited time period, maybe like three to four days, a maximum a week. So to, you cannot, of course, I mean the length is where it differs. In a newspaper, the long form piece will be anything between 2400 words at max, starting from 18 to 2400 words. In magazine, my longest published piece were I think 15,000 words. It started out at like 30,000 words. <laughs> Less than that. <laughs> so so uh, you have the breadth and you can go deeper in a magazine. In the newspaper, even if you find the time, you don't have the space to go much deeper about the story. So that is the ma basic difference. So you approach the story in a very different manner. Like, Caravan has now come to have of its profiles. But the profile in Caravan is never just about a person. It's about an idea of, of what the person represents. That's why what makes the person important for us to, understand, to learn more about him or her. Writing for a newspaper, just because a person is in news can be profiled. It can be an instant profile, which is very different from what a, ca what, what a magazine will do. Right. I think just one, mo adding one more thing to what Krishna said, that a lot of times when you work for a hard copy publication, like what we used to do at the Helka and a couple of other places also, that they print the smaller piece in the hard copy and then put the whole thing online. Oh, yeah. And that is something I, like long form, what it does, at least it has done to me is that I'm increasingly finding myself to be incapable of writing smaller pieces, which is very sad and I need to work on it. But you kind of spoiled also that you Right, but how, how has, has your writing changed from the Helka say and the kind of journalism that was done then and that you kind of grew up in um, to now and with the newer platforms and different kinds of spaces? Do you see like an approach changing or uh, maybe a different kind of audience or a different kind of tone even in your pieces? So for the first uh, five years of my journalism, I was only working with investigations team. So I think this is something what freelancing has also done to me because I had never thought that I would write a piece about English in Ottawa or like a special marriage act about my own uh, wedding or which everybody laughed at me for that. And uh, or write a Akhilesh piece or a Mayavati piece. And I think that is the kind of flexibility also like uh, like the first, I'd written also for magazines, like I don't know if people know about it, there's a magazine called Fountain Inc. And that also does long form journalism published out of Chennai. And what they do is, I was telling that they, the, the magazine is quite successful because 
they only target two tier cities and which is why people they've developed this loyal readership and people pick up the hard copy and it's for 40 bucks and people read it and they're making money out of it so i'm saying that uh, this kind of flexibility of you know getting into things like krishna said that it's a, uh, a long term piece is also about an issue if you get into a profile of akhilesh yadav you have to know what has happened like 20 years back or what's going to happen you have to be have you have to develop that vision to be able to see okay how what shape will this take 10 years down the line and i think that is something that uh, you know with uh, in a long form piece, then you're far more invested. You actually, like you said, because you take more time, you read up about those things. And as a journalist, then uh, it gives you an edge, I think. Also, sorry, also, uh, like in a newspaper, when you're reporting for a newspaper, you almost always know what you're going after, what you are trying to report. In a long form piece, when you're spending three to four months with a subject, you do not know what the story will be at the end of it. The arguments, you constantly discuss, uh, like have, have these arguments in your own head, what is the story? Why is this person important? Why is this particular subject important? So you're, so you're just trying to go with the hypotheses. You don't have a story when you start. Even a profile, you don't, do not know what, this, what the profile will look like. Profile is beyond a biography. So in, in a long form or a narrative piece, the story develops as you report. You, know, you don't go after a story. You just go after a subject. Then you find the story over there. And sometimes it's much later that you realize, you know, things you may have found in the story come come true or uh, become way more important. Like coming back to your Akhilesh profile, you talked a lot about the family and about his wife and everything. So can you talk a little bit about how now that came out what, over a year and a half ago, yeah, I guess? 2015. Yeah. Yeah. So for like Akhilesh piece, I think what was very important was. Because everybody when at that point of time would say that there are five and a half chief ministers in Akhilesh and point five was Akhilesh. Five were the other family members. And which is why I thought it was very important to bring in the family part. Uh, and how things have uh, panned out now, it is actually the family playing a big part in the political party and has almost led to a split. So at that point, I think, um, because after the piece was published, there was some feedback that, oh, a woman journalist has written a political piece, and which is why she has brought in the family. And not really looking at the relevance of why the family has been brought in politically, but just because a woman is writing, she will write about the family. So there are th this, 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 this perception problem, and I'm only glad that I'm vindicated now because things have panned out this way. So yes, there are those things. And sometimes you profile someone in long form and you end up working for them as Krishna did. <laughs> not for them. <laughs> but that's true, not exactly for them. <laughs> also in long form, there's a lot more of the writer that's involved, as a reporter, as a writer as well. How you see Akhilesh's life will be very different from how I see Akhilesh's life. So what the profile will turn out to be depends upon the reporter in, in a very large manner. So the, the eye become even if the eye is not in the written world, it's very strong how the story is structured and how it's reported and how it's written. So the writer, that's why the same, I mean, the same person can be profiled in 10 different ways. But who does the profile that works for that moment can be extremely important. Right, and every reporter kind of knows this, that when you approach a subject, they will treat you a certain way based on who you are. I mean, they also are sizing you up just as you're sizing them up. That doesn't come out very often in shorter pieces or in, in the newspaper reporting, but in a long term piece it I mean, it's true. I remember I was uh, profiling a person and the person called me. Name the person. <laughs> <laughs> I was profiling Shekhar Gupta and he uh, called somebody whom I knew and he said, I don't think Caravan is serious about this profile, they send a cub reporter. <laughs> so that's what, and maybe he let his guard down after that, but he did speak a lot. Yeah, and after the Akhilesh piece, I heard somebody very close to him saying that Larki dikti to baut sidi thi, nikli baut kami ni. You've worked as a freelancer and, and an institution. What are the different kinds of support that you have or wish you had? Um, you know, you were given, you may be given three months to do a piece, but how are you paying rent, you know? Yeah. So how is that kind of, how do you make it work in, in this industry and what do you wish it looked like? I mean. Oh God, I don't know why we're discussing this. 
It's a very important question. <laughs> yeah, so as a freelancer, because um, if you're working on a long form piece and if you're only working on one piece for three months, four months, and the kind of money you make after those four months of work is not enough to take care of your monthly expenses for those four months. And that is why I kind of try to work simultaneously on smaller pieces and longer pieces and um, just to pay rent and bills. I have also teach in some universities. But how just quickly making two, three points is that, uh, and I'm, I don't mean it for one particular publication. I across uh, Across the board, the payment is an average delay of three to four months. The payment is very low. Sometimes you don't get reporting expense, and which is why a lot of times as an independent journalist, you end up doing stories because you really want to do them. So which is why you stay, stay in cheap hotels, you stay at people's houses and villages, wherever there is food, you eat that to meet the reporting expenses. So that is why I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to do any kind of ground reporting. And it's uh, getting into, it's moving in a direction where it's more convenient to sit and write a quick opinion piece and put it out rather than like actually be actually manage to go to the ground and do some kind of reporting so i think that is uh, that that's a major challenge we're seeing this in newspapers too where you know reporters are getting cut to some extent in some papers it's happened recently you know uh, in the in the smaller towns and so on editions getting cut but do you feel like there is institutional sort of support and just in terms of backing up, uh, if you report something, you'll be stood, you know, someone will stand behind you? Fortunately, I've worked with Caravan and Express and both of them are great institutions. They have supported me always. Uh, whether it's an angry response from the subject of the piece or it's a lawsuit, the institution has stood behind me. But definitely, I don't think there are many institutions now who are supporting journalists at the moment. They are going for maybe uh, star journalists, brand names. Not when you like when as a newspaper you shut down bureaus in eight cities and editions, then you are restricting yourself only to daily reporting, which is not how. I mean that's extreme. The, the the cities are extremely important to tell you what the country is thinking, and when you don't have a single reporter over there. You're only stuck with what is the, the lutein is telling and what is happening uh, in the PMO or that city, but that is not the entire story. The effect of a PMO's decision, what is on the ground, what, what is the effect on the ground, we will not learn that. So the, it's it's very unfortunate that they're seeing bureaus as uh, extra expenses at this point, which I don't think At a time when they're buying drone cameras, which yeah. is, yeah. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about those cameras. <laughs> um, with long film, you, you have to keep uh, a reader's attention over a very long time. So um, have you guys worked with any uh, on any of your stories with you know visuals or infographics, things like that? And how is that kind of being brought in um, in different platforms? I don't think, I mean, the kind of long pieces that I think me and both Krishna have written, I don't think there has been uh, a lot of well, packaging. Yeah, there's yeah. no packaging. And I wish there was some of it. Mm. Because with more and more multimedia platforms coming in, more and more online portals coming in, I think, yeah, OK. More and more online portals coming in, I think some uh, like scroll is trying that, or a wire is trying that. But particularly how to integrate that in long form pieces, I don't think it has happened. And you also have to invest in the photojournalist as yeah. well, yeah. And, or videographer, or yeah. somebody. Yeah. Some of my pieces have had some additional support. Uh, one of my editors at Caravan, Alex, he said that we as a narrative journalism magazine should be able to express everything through words. We do not need infographics to describe what we are talking about. But that only worked to a particular extent. After that, I, did a, I, I wrote a piece on NDTV, and there was a very complex structure of how money uh, went through from one company to another and where it finally ended and who has control of NDTV and the company that owns NDTV. That could, even if it could be described, the, the reader will lose interest with so much jargon and names of shell companies and what vote has been taken. So there we had a full page infographic just to show how, where the money started, where it has ended, who has control over what. So sometimes you do need this visual support. 
Could you guys talk a little bit about pre-reporting, which isn't something um, necessarily every journalist does a whole lot of in the country, mm. but if you have to write something that's 10,000 words, you kind of need a plan. So mm. talk about how you come up with the plan. And I think pre-reporting, all the more important for me because I'm a freelancer and I have to pitch those stories to editors and then it is then the stories are commissioned and I start working on them. And that also requires a lot of time and effort and money or speaking to people. And then like, for instance, uh, the story I had done in July for Outlook about RSS trafficking 31 girls from uh, the Northeast and sending them to Punjab and Gujarat, which meant that when this information came to me through a source, also meant that before I actually pitch it to an editor, I also need to corroborate it or see, uh, get hold of the documents that say that this has happened and get hold or speak to at least a few parents who have sent their children. And that does require a lot of time and effort and your network, of course. Christian? As I said earlier, a, a long form piece is also a hypothesis. So to you will have the hypothesis, you need some pre-reporting. You need to understand what you are even trying to go after. What the story will be later, it totally depends upon what you find. But you need the pre-reporting just to have a starting point. This is what I will look into. This is why Akinesh matters. This is why Mayavati matters. Or this is why NADV finances matter. So that pre-reporting doesn't mean that you start pre-reporting only when you want to look into the subject. The pre-reporting can come through your reading earlier, through your own experience, through your own uh, you know, work you have done earlier. But you need that starting point that only comes after you have pre-reported upon the subject. It's also like he's saying that for, like the, for the Mayavati piece, I think I started soon after May 2014. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, just four months of pure reporting, but like all those one and a half years, you were constantly at it that, okay, maybe this will be useful for my story when I actually start doing it. So yeah. It's also a vast amount of information you're kind of juggling and are there tools that you use or ways to organize information that you, we used to have something in Caravan where we had this Excel sheet with literally lists of every source, you know, every location, every event that was important. But do you end up using anything like that uh, have you, or similar things? I mean, when you're interviewing about 40, 50 people for a story, it's of course tough to manage and just decide what will go in, what will not. I, when I start writing, I, I, I create cue cards for myself. Uh, I divide the story into sections as I write it. Each section, on the, on the front of the cue card, I mention what the topics I'm going to cover in the section. At the back of the cue card, I mention the interviews I'm going to use, the sources I'm going to use for this particular section. So then each section becomes an island itself. You create each island, and then you bring it together at the end. Okay, I need a workshop for that. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm very unorganized that way. My only tool is this. So I most of the time, I don't even uh, like uh, recording the interviews because that would mean coming back and transcribing it and that just <laughs> so and also because when you re use a recorder the conversation completely changes and people don't say the same things when they see a tape recorder or something of that sort. So yes, I just totally rely on notebooks and I the only thing I do is like put a date to it and take my notes as in when I'm speaking to people and then eventually I write the whole thing together. And once the whole thing is written is when I decide, okay, these may be different sections, and then I do the restructuring. Yeah. Also, while interviewing for uh, a long-form piece, it's very different. Looking for a newspaper when you interview, again, you're going with a particular, something in your mind, this is what you have to find, this is what you want the person to talk about. In, when you're reporting long-form, you just, you're trying to find people who might know about the subject you're writing. And you talk to them for half an hour, for hour, two, one hour, two hours. I've had four hour long interviews. And you might just end up using two quotes or two anecdotes from what the person's spoke to you. So the interview process is very different. Yeah. These are conversations. You're not going for a formal one-to-one -one interview and you're asking direct yeah. questions, okay, tell me what happened over there. Do you're just talking about the person's experience. And this is not just about when I'm say, uh, when I talk about any profiles. Even I remember working on a story about ONGC and what role Reliance has played in ONGC's decline. And I met a former petroleum secretary and he said, in the uh, petroleum ministry, you, can, you cannot be R negative, you can only be R positive or R neutral, which means your inclination towards Reliance. So now I cannot go with a question in my mind asking about what is R positive. This is what the person spoke and that anecdote has stuck with 
money, of course. So these, the, the tools you need for long form are just very different. Do you sometimes feel like you're even educating your uh, interview subjects because they expect you to, you know, 10 minutes wrap up interview and be gone? How do you kind of toss it in there and just kind of sit and drink cups of chai and not move? <laughs> so, uh, I will uh, just continuing what uh, Krishna said and answering your question. There's a lot of filtering that you need to do while you speak to people. For instance, I remember during the Akhilesh piece, I met a number of Chhatranetas from Samajwadi Party and which would mean like sitting with them and talking and then they would start with this like really uh, stupid shyri that and then they would send it to me on whatsapp saying diye jalte hai, hawa chalti hai, neha ji aapki yaad aati hai and then 5.30, 5.30 in the morning they would say neha ji reply kyo nahi kar rahi hai and then they'll they, 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 they do some background research about you and then find out about some relatives staying in UP in some part about your partner or something and then come back. So that interview process, like Krish said, that when we are talking to people also means answering their questions and that can get very tricky. Um, so once the story has been written, whether it's been written up using note cards or, you know, just in a, in a flood of information, um, it goes to an editor. And I guess um, I just wanted to ask both of you what your experience working with editors in long form has been like and uh, how is it different? I think you should answer that <laughs> question first. Uh, uh, well, I mean, it's very intensive. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure it depends place to place because Caravan, we did a lot of rewriting. So we would literally take the piece apart, you know, put it back section by section, send it back to the writer at least five times mm -hmm. uh, just to, you know, change things, add things, subtract things. And the piece might be half the length at the end of the day. Um, but I'm sure different places are different, so um, what's kind of your preference and what's... Um I think, like I said, line editing is very diff very difficult in a long form piece because you're also kind of uh, cross-checking the information and fact-checking whatever is written. But again, it depends from place to place. Like I, was, I said, that the Outlook piece was again 14,000 words, similar to the 14,000 words that were published for the Mayavati piece in Caravan. So in Outlook, I had submitted 15,500 and they were cut to 14,000 and printed. But in Caravan, I would sent 21,000 and they were cut again. But there was a lot of rewriting and a lot of, say, let's say, like ironing, ironing out of the sentences. So I think it depends from place to place. But also, I would say at a time when uh, the Indian media and there is a bureaus are being shut down, I think the uh, one place that is really getting affected is the desk in uh, uh, media houses because at one time I remember people would say that the desk is the backbone of any, uh, you know, any publishing house or any uh, newspaper or news magazine. But it, people are increasingly giving less and less importance to the desk which actually fact checks, corroborates, asks the reporter to come back with more information. I think as a reporter and somebody who works independently and doesn't really have a newsroom or a set of colleagues or editors to give me feedback and how to make my pieces better. I really miss that part that some places do not have editors invested enough in a story to make it better. You have to basically do a lot more fact checking yourself and it's on, it's on you. As a writer, I would like to be edited lightly, of course, and to have more of my own sentences, my voice in the piece. But as a journalist, I've always been happy with the end product of after, you know, eight days of straight editing, one piece, reading it like 15 times. So as a, as a journalist, I don't mind the editing that much. If it means the piece becomes better. And when it goes through three different eyes, it also ensures that every fact has been corroborated at least thrice or, or four times, which also gives me a buffer sometimes to make a slight mistake here and there. Like a dog's name may Like a dog's name sometimes. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, with, 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 with newspapers, the touch is, of course, much lighter. I th it's... Plus, as she said, the desk is overworked in newspapers anyhow. I'm sure even in magazines the desk is overworked. But uh, it's, it's very intensive with, with a magazine like Caravan. So I don't mind that essentially. So what is the dog story? I got a dog's gender wrong uh, while reporting on Shekhar Gupta's profile. So he, <laughs> he pointed that out in an interview. <laughs> yeah, someone is always looking. Someone is always watching. <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to ask you, uh, working on a book, so how has long form kind of pre prepared you for this and what's different? 
I think long term uh, writing is definitely gave me the idea that actually I can convert this particular thing in a book. So if I can say roughly there are two people that I am following and uh, these are women who work in Delhi in the unorganized sector and one of them was displaced during the Babri Masjid demolition and is a Muslim woman and the other one is a Dalit woman who was displaced during the Ranveer Sena's attack in Mojpur. So both of them came to Delhi around the same time and how since then they have changed some 35 jobs. But why I got interested in it because through this, because of my previous long term pieces I realized that there is a possibility to explore the kind of caste violence and the kind, kind of religious violence on women who are anyway marginalized because of their gender and because then they are working in the unorganized sector and they have changed 35 jobs in 20 years. That means a lot which means acquiring new skills, you know, uh, meeting different contractors who can give them that kind of work, living as migrants in Delhi. So there is a lot of things and I think the long, uh, because you've been doing long form pieces, you kind of say, get some kind of confidence also that okay, you can get into this and explore it better. Any plans to write a book, Krishna? Nothing yet. <laughs> okay, maybe you can just tell us about um, what was the kind of story that you were commissioned to do or you started doing um, and you thought this is a great long form idea but it presented different kinds of challenges. So maybe you could just talk about what, you know, how do you hold the reader's attention and how do you kind of work with what you have sometimes? I think one of the toughest stories uh, that I have written in the sense is the OMGC piece because it's very dense. It's about oil and gas, it's about you know, a PSU and uh, a lot of jargon into about what is, how oil is trilled. So, so how do you break it down for the reader and keep the reader interested? That was, I think, a challenge. And how did you kind of do it? Even reliance into it, so of course, that grabs the reader's uh, attention most of the times. But again, even with the PSU, then you think of the PSU as a character and you think of what, who are the other characters. They could be industries or companies or people. And then you, you personify each of those companies and then you tell the story. That makes it easier. Okay, so yeah, uh, something similar, again, uh, somebody the approached me to write a piece on for Smithsonian on this dinosaur fossil park in Gujarat. So which was completely out of my territory and I never thought that I would do it. But then again, like I'll, I'll sound like a very cheap person here, but again there was a lot of money coming my way, so I said, okay, I'll do it. But it was very difficult because I've never done science writing before. But just landing up there and in that fossil park and there was this princess who was taking care of the fossil park and doing this kind of dinosaur tourism there and which was very interesting. So which is why because I had done these earlier pieces where one didn't know about what one was getting into but eventually managed. I think with this piece also I ended up writing a science long form piece which my family was very proud of because I was a science student but I never pursued it further. So yeah. Yeah or you have a, a subject like Mayavati who everybody has written about and books have been written about her and how do you kind of make it interesting again yeah. um, kind of. Yeah, yeah. like because uh, a piece, a book like uh, Ajay Pursa's book Bahinji was already there in 2007. So it was very difficult to again write about her and which is why uh, the brief that came to me. subject is yes. also limited, right? Yeah. The brief that came to me was very helpful because I was told that because there's a book already, uh, find out what did she do after she lost in 2014. So which was a good way to start because then you kind of have some focus that there is a, it's kind of finite, the time that you're looking at, it's interesting. And because uh, right now there's so much of uh, Dalit assertion, Dalit crimes against Dalits, which has kind of mobilized people on the issue and everybody is now talking about the Dalit Muslim Alliance and all these things politically that are happening which may or may not directly be relevant to what I'm writing but it's there. That's kind, that, that is giving me a kind of background. 
and which is why it was the brief is very important and that's where the editor steps in and tells you that okay right. this You're is what you should look at. Always looking at someone to celebrate their accomplishments yeah. but sometimes when they're at their lowest yeah. point is yeah. when it's interesting to actually be following and them. And also her like a Dalit woman, you know, the kind, a Dalit woman politician in the most feudal state in India. That that journey that she made also and right now what it is like, I think that really is something I thought was not explored. So I tried to look at it like Again, that. I mean, that's a, coming back to the point that a profile is not just about the person. The profile is about the idea. The person represents that idea. So you are actually telling the story of how that idea has grown or what this person is representing at this moment. It's not a biography, which a lot, it, I mean, a lot of people confuse a profile with a biography. And again, that's where the journalist comes in. How Neha saw Mayavati, maybe Ajay Bhus will never see her like that. So that in, in, in narrative non-fiction, the idea and the journalist become extremely important to, to what the story will be at the end of it. Yeah, actually, because uh, at one point, while I was reporting on it, I had, I had to meet a bureaucrat and I was in the revenue office in Lucknow. And I was just standing there and waiting for him to come. And I, I'm not exaggerating, at least seven to eight people just walked up to me and said, why are you standing here? Kyu milna hai? Akele kyu milna hai? And which was very humiliating because then they kind of dismiss you and they think that there is this kind of young person, young woman standing there and who wants to meet a bureaucrat alone, which has some kind, they, which gives them ideas. And I then realized that, okay, if for me there, I'm just parachuted from somewhere and standing there for an interview, it's so difficult to exist. How difficult would it, would it have been for a Dalit woman to control this entire machinery and exist? Yeah, it's so amazing insights you can get. I think we should open it to questions now. Uh, so if anyone has a question for either of these guys. Oh my God. Hi, um, thank you very much for the speech. Um, it's a very selfishly motivated question. I just kind of want to pick your brains while I've got you here. Um, basically, you mentioned as well like the new, the new um, media landscape and kind of we all know that the industry is in trouble. So if you would have any um, advice for someone starting out with no contacts, it seems that now there's kind of this, this, there's this traditional option of, you know, pitching traditional outlets and just bombarding inboxes of people who had 100 emails a day. But there's the other option of kind of um, putting your own work online on your own platform and then kind of through that trying to build a kind of presence. And it both takes a lot of time. So what's, since you're here, what's your take on it? Um, and if, I, if we could hear maybe your origin stories quickly. Um. I think there's no harm in bombarding people's inboxes because that is what they oh, are. For someone with a full-time job, it takes time. <laughs> yeah. No, but that, that is what the job is, to look at pictures and look at ideas. And mm -hmm. so I don't, I, I think we should be completely shameless about it because I, I do it all the time and I did it when I passed out from journalism school and, you know, just to get people uh, interested. And also as far as putting your work out there is concerned. It's a very good idea, but at the same time, there are several places now who are, especially the web portals, which are completely dependent on contributors now. They have very less staffers. The number of staffers is very less. Most of the content comes from contributors. I think there is no harm in actually sending your ideas and getting some kind of input from the editor also, who can he or she can tell you how to follow it through. So I think, yes, there is that option also available and sh should be made use of. But putting your work out there just by yourself, you'll not make money. And long form needs a lot of money. Yes. It needs time and money. You need money to travel, to report, to sustain yourself. So putting your stuff out there. To buy books. To buy books, mm -hmm. for research, everything. So just putting your work out there, I don't think is the best idea. As she said, keep bombarding editors. A good editor is always happy to see a good story pitch. So keep bombarding them. OK. Thank you. I think both of you came out of traditional kind of media, maybe not super traditional, but at least uh, media institutions. And I think in some way I would just add that there's kind of no substitute for working in that environment for at least some time. 
before striking out on your own, but um, that's just kind of my opinion. Yeah. Two questions I have for both of you. Uh, since you said about narrative journalism, which involves lots of I, the narrator, it also involves lots of deliberately, if not suppressing, at least leaving out certain facts, which doesn't suit the narrative. So give me some examples of your own uh, stories when you deliberately left out certain facts, if there are such. Second is, uh, you mostly uh, report on issues, on people who speak in one language, but you write in another language. So it's not just reporting, it's translation. Like your Akhlesh piece, Mayavati piece, I'm sure your uh, ONGC also, Shekhar Gupta for instance. How much you believe is lost in translation? So what is what report do we have? How much filter it is? Okay, so I would say that even when uh, a long form piece sounds like it has all the information, it is finite. It's not encyclopedic. There are only certain scenes, like you said, there are only certain scenes, certain characters you pick up to be able to tell whatever you're telling. But at the same time, yes, the language issue is definitely there. For uh, uh, instance, uh, in the Mayavati piece, when I was talking to someone, they said, and uh, they said about Brahmins, कि जिस भी गांव में एक भी ब्राह्मण का घर होता है उसका रास्ता टेढ़ा ही होता है now if you literally translate it it means something else but you know you have to be able to say that okay this means that the because they are on the top of the varna system they kind of manipulate everything and they make things happen their way so yes there is always that but again uh, like I said it's finite and you you can only tell certain things like in a film, when you're making a film, you can only talk about certain things. If even if you write a book, it's not. It cannot be completely like it can't be fully comprehensive ever about uh, you know. So it's the same uh, problem with a long form piece also. The filtering, yes. For example, if uh, for instance, let's say the Mayavati piece. If you read that, it's all about her election strategy. There's not much about her personal life, but. A, which may, meant, like in the Akhilesh piece, there was a lot of bit about her personal, about his personal life. But so you kind of find a focus that okay, you are writing about elections and her strategy and what she, what she is going to do in 2017. Then there is not much scope to write about her personal, uh, like personal details. So which is why you leave that out. Like for example, like I can't remember if it was left in or not in the Akhilesh piece about his nose, about his nose and how he broke it. I can't remember if it made the final cut or not. No, it didn't. Like yeah. uh, <laughs> because uh, he has this kind of crooked nose and he broke it because he was playing football and then the doctor suggested that he shouldn't go for a surgery. So he's yeah, a very character. Yeah, and to which he says now that all smart people have a crooked nose and a long nose, like Indra Gandhi and uh, somebody else he mentioned. So. I mean, you do leave out certain facts or characters or anecdotes while doing a long piece. You, you can only omit them if you believe that they do not bring anything substantive to the piece. If there is an anecdote, even if it disproves your hypotheses, you leave it there. Because I think readers understand life is not a, stra it's not a straight line, it's complex. So people understand these complexities as well. Even if it disproves your theory, you put it there. If it is substantive, if it is important. If it's not, then you can leave it out quite easily. I think just to address the language thing, I, I thought about this a lot and at Caravan we always struggled with it. Um, finally, I remember in a Farida Khanum piece, we really wanted to retain the Urdu and the Punjabi that she used and I had such a fight with the copy editor because I said, no, our readers will understand. Anyone who's reading a long piece on Farida Khanum, we're putting the translation also, let's leave the flavor of the original. And I think in the Indian media, we still haven't kind of gained that self-confidence and also like a editorial uh, style book to deal with translation, to deal with idiomatic expressions. And that's something I would really like people to start thinking about more. Um, how do you kind of, what, what are the rules you follow? And plus, you can't translate everything. There was this uh, quote somebody said, somebody told me about the Ramnath Koenka where he came. He said, that's why he was so fearless. How do you translate that? You can't translate Lota in English. So, you know, there are all, of course, so you leave the original over there intact. You give the translation along with it, but when you think the quote gives a flavor, you give the quote in its original language. Or like somebody saying, ki Mayavati Amesha, tu mein baat karti hai. Now, how do you explain tu 
to somebody who's reading in English and that's Or you go into idiomatic English, yeah. like you may say ash to, you know, dust to dust, or you may say, you know, yeah, anything. So, oh. any more questions? Okay. Uh -huh. well, one more question. Firstly, congratulations to everyone for being very chatty and very general. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we were talking about finding the reader actually who reads, say, narrative journalism for that matter. And just to add a couple of pointers in order to substantiate and contextualize my question, uh, I remember Shivam Bridge writing in the very early days of Scroll about uh, his new magazine editor, which I think he was referring to Caravan, I'm taking my personal liberty, where he talked about that he found uh, the copies of magazine uh, at a place in Jammu and Kashmir. And the editor told him. He was fountaining. It was fountaining, you know, I'm really sorry. He said that don't tell this to the uh, marketing guy, he'll be offended. You know, we don't want our magazine to be, you know, selling on these, uh, I mean, stalls. So, and also, I think Supi and I wrote about it last year uh, in terms of who, I mean, like, why it took Caravan five years to have a female on the cover. So, in just what exactly goes behind in actually, uh, I mean, what story to sort of pursue, for that matter, I think the story that you did for Fountain Inc. of uh, women getting, uh, I mean, uh, uh, fired from the shops in uh, Tamil Nadu. So, I ever see that sort of uh, story in Caravan, for that matter. So, what goes behind uh, in terms of deciding which story exactly we will pursue in terms of its prominence? So, are we going to follow, say, the prominent people, you know, from St. Nicholas Daily, or, you know, what exactly goes behind it? I can tell. For reporters at Caravan, because there are so few, uh, when I was there, there were only two reporters, three reporters. So the magazine, because you are getting a, a monthly salary, so they want to in, want you to invest your time in high-profile stories. Other stories they expect can, be, can come from the freelancers. So that's why the staff well, writers... I'm taking great offense to that. <laughs> that's just <laughs> the business model. So goes in few freelancers. <laughs> so they want you, they want the staff writers whom they are paying, so for four months I'm getting a salary but my piece will come out in the fifth month. So that's why they want me to profile somebody who's important enough that the magazine will sell more copies when the story comes out. No, also, uh, as far as uh, women on the cover is concerned that I mean, I, I, I can't really refer to the piece and I think there were, so there was, I think so you could answer, maybe some editors would be able to answer it better, but uh, I think like for the, for the seven covers I've done, five, on, the, on those five, uh, five out of seven covers have had women. So I can say for myself, but again, I'm a writer and my story is making it with the cover, but that does not necessarily determine whether a magazine is going to plan it like that, that you know, it cannot be that, okay, out of the 12 covers we do this year, three will have them and three will have some other people. I don't think it can, it's I mean, possible. I don't think it's good, but yeah. I don't think we ha yet have the kind of staffs yeah. and luxury and forward planning. Uh, also, if it's a news magazine, it's not really uh, possible, you know, if something is relevant at that point then you will definitely put it out, but you can't do it for the sake of it. Like for the Karen, Karen example, I mean, there were two issues where we almost had a woman on the cover before that. One was the election issue that we did, um, in which one of the stories was Mamta, and we really would have put her on the cover, but then because it was an election issue, we did an election branded cover. That was like a really close call. The next one was Madhuri Dixit, mm -hmm. and I was like, just put her on the cover now, it's been four years, just put a woman and Supriya said, but I don't want the first woman on a political magazine cover to be, um, you know, uh, an actress. And we don't want to typecast women like that. So anyway, I don't, uh, there's no wrong or right and that is a debate and it always depends on many, many things. In that election issue, we had profiles of Amit Shah, Mamta, right. uh, Kate, Kate Chandrasekhar, so all these super top, top politicians. So, I mean, of course, Mamta could have been there, but it was a really uh, good issue, that one, election issue. And we happen to have a designer who did a really nice-looking election uh, graphic. So, you know, all these things. Are we, I think that's, okay, we have one more question. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Maybe two halves of a question. <laughs> uh, so, this for all three of you. So, with all, a lot of the journalism going into digital, and digital being supported by banners, do journal journalists or edu editors look at what is the kind of traffic time on the article and does it impact long form specifically? 
And maybe you just take the next question as well. At the same I just saw three words over there saying leveraged different departments. That sounded very exciting. It sounded sort of manipulating and get people, getting people around. But it doesn't seem as if there are such things as departments to be leveraged in your, in your uh, style of work. Though, of course, as you did mention, you've got to convince someone. But do you have to get a lot of help from different departments for this sort of thing? Okay, so one on uh, driving leadership and popularity and one on, yeah. As a reporter, I mean, you're left loose. You do whatever you can do. You have no departments, absolutely. It's only when the, at the editing table that you have to maybe convince uh, the editor for certain things, but that's about it. I don't think I've ever had to leverage anything in an organization or for my research. Uh, just answering for these questions, one thing is that, you know, there are there is no specific department, especially for this long form pieces, there is a lot of intersectionality, you know, that if you're writing about gender, there is also caste, there is also class, there's also religion, all those things. So there are several beats that you're simultaneously working on. So I don't know if department, yes, we could say like, uh, I don't know if it means the technical departments or whatever. But departments, yes. So there is a lot of intersectionality. You can't go with one thing in mind and again. As far as answering your question is concerned, yet with this digital age, I think we were discussing this before the panel that uh, it's it's actually only made long form more accessible for people across sections. Because in the past, if you would write for a magazine. And if that magazine like a caravan is for 100 bucks, only some people are, uh, uh, can manage to buy it. And because it's available only in the metros or bigger cities, only some people can read it. But with the content online and people who are genuinely interested, I've had students coming uh, from, uh, you know, uh, a Balia or a Gorakhpur who actually have looked up these pieces and read them be just because they're available digitally and not because these hard copies are not making it. Yes, there is still thankfully not that kind of pressure that there has there have to be, you know, uh, these number of, uh, like the traffic should be as high or as low. Thankfully it hasn't happened, but it is moving in that direction. I think that's all we have time for. So thank you everybody for listening and thank you both for thank your you. work.